Hello, I'm Mark Unkefer, Executive Director of the Fiber Optic Sensing Association, and I want to welcome you to our September webinar, uh, Safety, uh, rather Security and Safety Made Simple. Uh, we have one of our newer member uh, companies, NEC, which can provide us kind of an integrated look at uh, the use of fiber optic sensing in uh, these applications. We've got two presenters today from NEC, uh, Frank San Giorgi and uh, Giovanni Maloney, uh, who can both provide a, a fair amount of insights. Gentlemen, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Mark. And thanks for the opportunity to uh, present this morning. Um, this is Frank San Giorgi, and I would like to just start off with some uh, brief introductory slides uh, to tell you a little bit about who NEC is. And then I'll hand it over to Giovanni. Uh, so NEC, uh, we're a global company. Uh, we've been in existence since 1899. Uh, so in fact, this year we're celebrating our 120th anniversary. We have over 99,000 employees worldwide. And uh, around the globe, we have nine research and development labs. Uh, two of which are in the United States within Silicon Valley and in Princeton, New Jersey. As a result of our research labs around the, around the globe, we have uh, over 64,000 patents, which has really led to a lot of the innovative technologies that NEC has, uh, one of which that uh, Giovanni will be talking today uh, for our fiber optic sensing technology. Um, our headquarters is in Irving, Texas, and uh, here in the U.S., we've been celebrate we've celebrated over 50 years uh, of NEC um, for any Corporation of America in the U.S. We um, have been a leader in biometrics and identity management solutions for uh, for decades, and uh, and this is really through uh, testing that we have uh, that NIST National Institute of Standards has achieves and tests our technologies every year or every other year. And also NEC is listed as one of the top 50 innovative companies. Next slide. So NEC Corporation worldwide, we have 200 large scale implementations across 30 countries. So this includes law enforcement related solutions, identity management, uh, border management, immigration. And um, if you could go to the next slide, please. And then closer uh, to home, uh, we, I personally have, I'm based in our Washington DC office where my focus is on the federal government. Uh, we are working closely with the US Customs and Border Protection as well as the Office of Biometric Identity Management and, and as part of the Department of Homeland Security and uh, working with the Department of Defense, DOD, and many of the other uh, three-letter agencies with, with regards to identity management and security and helping improve the mission of these agencies. Next slide. So in the United States, this shows a map of footprint of many of our customers that we have. Uh, so those states that are highlighted in blue represent statewide customers. And also the uh, states highlighted in orange are also statewide customers, but the orange uh, states represent a hosted solution that NEC offers as part of our, our portfolio, we are able to host identity management solutions um, uh, as, a, as an NEC hosted, or we can work with third-party uh, hosting companies like Amazon and Microsoft. Next slide. So uh, with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Giovanni Milione. Uh, who will talk about our fiber optic sensing technology. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, so this is Dr. Giovanni Milione. Uh, I am a researcher in NEC's Princeton, New Jersey laboratories. Um, I have kind of an interesting background. Uh, before I uh, finished my degrees, I was actually in the military for about eight years, and I served in, uh, during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, uh, deployed to the Middle East. Um, afterwards, I kind of used the GI Bill 
to uh, finish my education, and I, I kind of started to go to school and never stopped. I, I got a Bachelor's of Science, a Master's of Arts, a Master's of Philosophy, and a PhD in, all, in physics. Uh, most of my academic and uh, industry career has been working with fiber optics. I uh, have accumulated something like 100 plus publications and patents. Um, I primarily research high speed, long distance fiber optic communication, fiber optic sensing, and machine learning based AI. I work with a team of about uh, 15 uh, for fiber optic, uh, and I work with a team of about uh, 10 for machine learning. And uh, that is a small part of the hundreds of researchers NEC has around the world. And so together, we have kind of been. Um, taking all of our, our fiber optic expertise and our machine learning based eye expertise and putting it into this product for uh, fiber optic sensing. So uh, my, like I was saying, my, my team has been working in fiber optic uh, communication R&D for about 40 plus years. Uh, we basically have uh, looked at everything uh, physically in optical fibers, from nonlinearities uh, to chromatic dispersion, polarization mode coupling and dispersion, uh, optical amplification, uh, dealing with optoelectronic noise at detectors or otherwise, uh, dealing with all types of scattering, Rayleigh, Brillion, and Raman. Uh, we deal with a lot of high-speed signal processing in the communication world. We also deal with a lot of optical switching and networking. And we uh, also work with a number of different uh, fiber optic companies, and we do fiber optic design for optimized um, communication and, and, and those things. And uh, our bread and butter has been kind of long-distance, high-speed communication. Uh, one of uh, NEC's uh, predominant products is what we call submarine communication network, uh, cable networks. And basically, we will lay a cable of optical fiber between uh, two countries, like in the picture you see on the bottom right, uh, Japan and the U.S. And uh, we will, uh, it, th those distances scale like uh, thousands of kilometers, and we will send light back and forth. Uh, you can kind of think of this as the most extreme conditions for optical fibers, where over those lengths you have to deal with very little light. You have to be able to detect that light. Uh, you also have to deal with extreme temperature and pressure conditions, et cetera. So we, to do that, to make that work effectively, uh, you have to understand almost everything physically that's going on in an optical fiber and those things that I've listed there on the left. Uh, just to give you context, uh, every, year after year we do this, and we are kind of, our job is to kind of, come up with new ways to do it better and we uh, are constantly uh, our, our job is to kind of set some new records or to, to break some limit or something like this as you can see in those press releases uh, and in terms of fiber optic sensing as you can kind of see at the bottom recently we have done the first field trial of fiber optic sensing and high-speed communication over an existing telecommunication network so we work with a lot of different customers worldwide uh, telecommunication customers government customers commercial customers Customers, where we kind of leverage our optical fiber expertise into optical fiber sensing. Uh, and then we kind of combine that with our machine learning based uh, AI expertise where our machine learning teams have 40 plus years of machine learning based AI R&D experience. Uh, we kind of have every tool under our belt for machine learning, deep learning, supervised learning. Uh, unsupervised learning, where you uh, don't need to actually know what's going on. It'll kind of learn on its own. Uh, NEC has also been involved, uh, has been one of the primary people, if not the primary person, developing uh, one of the most popular open source languages for machine learning called Torch. So uh, I, I like to use this term a lot. Uh, I, I, I hope it's not overselling, but we have veritably wrote the book on machine learning and fiber optics in a lot of ways. Uh, some applications that we use in the uh, machine learning for in the company are digital pathology. That's effectively cancer detection. Uh, we can detect uh, defects in manufacturing. We can do uh, look for spoof detection in the stock market to see if there's illegal trades or something like this. And we also apply this to one of our predominant uh, technologies, facial recognition. So the, the point is, is that we have been uh, working in a number of different technologies over many years, uh, fiber optic communication, machine learning, and recently we have combined those into a fiber optic sensing product uh, where we think we have made some significant advantages for the security and safety market. Uh, so just to give a quick overview of what fiber optic sensing is so we can relate it to the applications of security and safety, basically a fiber optic is a long strand of glass uh, in which light travels. 
Uh, and so basically, if anything changes in the environment, whether that be vibration, acoustics, strain, pressure, temperature, or, or whatever, it will change the glass. So that light in the glass will change if the glass changes. The light is kind of a probe of how the glass changes, and that reveals what's going on in the environment. Uh, there's a lot of physical things going on. Uh, some of those some kind of uh, buzz phrases, the photoelastic effect, which is basically strain changing the glass, the a Poisson ratio, which is a, a combination of strain and pressure on the glass, a Doppler shift, uh, which is a, uh, an effect of temperature and strain on the glass. And so we will measure any kind of physical thing going on in the glass by probing it with light. And effectively, any thermodynamic uh, quantity can be sensed with the fiber optic sensing. So again, it's kind of the sensor is the fiber optic. We use light as a probe. And uh, we can, uh, using any of these physical phenomena, just by detecting the light, we can get any uh, thermodynamic quantity like strain, pressure, temperature, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and also things like vibration and acoustics, which are effectively time-dependent strain. Uh, so we use time or frequency domain techniques like optical time domain reflectometry or optical frequency domain reflectometry or other techniques where we can basically convert every few feet of the optical fiber uh, into a sensor over tens of miles. Uh, the, we will utilize uh, processes like Rayleigh scattering, Brillion scattering, or Raman scattering to look at whatever uh, environmental thing we want to see, temperature, strain, acoustic. And then we will apply things like machine learning to it uh, to be able to turn that sensing into some actionable data. So with the machine learning based AI, we can uh, convert uh, those events instantly and accurately uh, into some kind of location. Uh, we can provide actionable data like a GPS coordinate or an event classification. And we can discriminate uh, those events from nuisances like uh, the weather or rain or uh, some anomalous vibration in the ground or some anomalous temperature uh, by using machine learning. And also, our, because of the machine learning based AI, we can adjust to season and weather dependent changes. Uh, those things can be learned and they can be accounted for. So you don't need to adjust your sensing when uh, the springtime comes or when there's a frost in the winter or when the heat is extreme in the summer. Uh, additionally, uh, because of that, we're able to, because of this machine learning based AI, we're able to uh, adapt our system to various deployments. We can put a fiber optic uh, on a fence, uh, we could bury it in the ground, we can put it on a wall, we can put it in a building, and all those things, all we have to do is have the machine learning learn about how it's deployed, and then the sensor can be adjusted so it works uh, accordingly. And we can use new or pre-existing optical fiber. Uh, for example, if a new cable is buried in the ground, we can connect our system to that. Uh, of course, uh, it's sometimes it's optimal to use new deployments to deploy a fiber optic so it has uh, optimal sensing capabilities. Uh, however, it's not necessary. Uh, we can take some existing fiber optic, whether it be a, a, a local area network fiber optic in a building, or it be uh, a fiber optic that's deployed around a metropolitan area, or maybe it's a fiber optic that's deployed along a, a pipeline. We can just plug in, and our machine learning based AI can learn about the environment and it can optimize itself. So we're able to detect the events that are necessary and uh, reduce the nuisances. Uh, and of course, we can integrate it and it can complement other sensors like cameras or other um, uh, alert management systems. So in terms of safety and security, uh, especially when we think about some of our other safety and security products like uh, facial recognition uh, or our, our, our video surveillance, uh, really what fiber optics provide are an advantage uh, over some of the things where those other products fall short. Uh, for example, if you think about conventional technologies for safety and security, uh, like a camera but not limited to a camera, some other technologies may be um, bi-static or monostatic microwave sensors, or it could be an infrared laser sensor or, or uh, even a, a geophone. Uh, these things all are, mo uh, many of them are electronic based and they use electronic signals for communication and they require electro, uh, electric power. Uh, so uh, those sensors will be very susceptible to electromagnetic interference, whether it be a coaxial cable on a fence near an airport where the rate of communication at the airport may cause false alarms on the cable, 
uh, et cetera. In contrast, a fiber optic is uh, immune to this because basically the fiber optic is just glass and light. And so from the physics perspective, the, uh, uh, the frequency range of radio frequencies don't see the glass. Uh, so that's one advantage of fiber optics over a conventional um, technology. Uh, also, fiber optics don't require electrical power in the field. Uh, many security technologies, like cameras, but some of the other technologies I mentioned, you have to power them every few hundred feet. They have to have a, a, a power source that has to be linked to an existing uh, electrical power infrastructure, or you need to create new electrical power infrastructure uh, to be able to operate it. Uh, but for fiber optics, because uh, they just use light and glass, and that light can propagate many miles over the glass, uh, you don't need electrical power in the field. Basically, wherever you have the optical fiber, that is the sensor. It, it is doing sensing. And this can be done over ten, many tens of miles. Uh, additionally, with uh, conventional technologies, like again for cameras, you have to communicate with them to get whatever they're sensing back to you to know what they're sensing. Uh, in fiber optic sensing, actually the light itself is doing the communication of what that sensing is. So there's no need for any additional Wi-Fi or communication signals uh, coming back. Uh, also, things like cameras or, or uh, microwave or infrared detectors require a line of sight. Uh, you have to, whatever you want to detect, of course, you have to kind of have a line of sight to it. Uh, fiber optics, uh, it's not necessary because they can basically be deployed however they're laid and you just sense the environment around it. So it, it kind of um, eliminates the need for line of sight, which may ease things like deployments. You can deploy fiber optics in places where you may not have been able to employ cameras. Also, it may complement those technologies like covering blind spots and things like this. Uh, additionally, some of these technologies, uh, they don't operate over very long distances, maybe a, a few hundred feet at most, but fiber optics, again, can go uh, many miles of, uh, of sensing without, uh, with still being able to sense. This uh, advantage may reduce the number of sensors you require for security and safety. Uh, it also may be able to, if you have those other sense, uh, many cameras along, for example, a perimeter, by providing fiber optic sensing, it just provides another layer uh, where you don't have to double up on your sensors or something like this. Uh, additionally, uh, m many things like cameras and uh, and uh, microwave and other things like this, they, uh, their location accuracy is based on a zone. Uh, they will sense within a zone of, let's say, a few hundred feet. So you know what's happening or you know where your event is within that uh, few hundred feet. However, with fiber optics, uh, you can kind of pinpoint the event to within a few feet. Uh, and and uh, that that's actually a significant advantage because you're able effectively, again, using the uh, techniques I showed in the previous slide, you can convert every few feet of the fiber optic into a sensor, and therefore you can get location accuracy uh, within those few feet. Uh, also, cameras and things like this are uh, depend on lighting condition, so you you're, uh, you may not be able to uh, see things, of course, in the dark, or uh, if it's slightly cloudier, uh, your uh, camera conditions may change, and of course there are things like, uh, you know, infrared um, cameras that can see in low light conditions. However, of course, even then, if you have a bright source of light, it changes how you're, uh, you're, you're seeing. Uh, this is especially important for applications like facial recognition where uh, any lighting condition can change the way you're acquiring that image and then it changes how well you uh, recognize the face. Uh, in contrast, fiber optics don't depend on lighting conditions. So whether it's day, night, uh, whether there's fog or if there's uh, all of a sudden it's cloudy, you're always going to operate the same way. Uh, and also because, again, lending itself towards the no need for electrical power or, or not being um, uh, susceptible to electromagnetic interference, uh, fiber optics are not temperature dependent. The electronics or the battery power, the actual power supplying other sensors, uh, they will always will have temperature limits. Uh, but for fiber optics, uh, there's basically, basically your glass can withstand extreme temperatures. So even on uh, ext an extremely uh, hot climates or something like this, uh, you don't have any effect on, on the sensing. Um, and then, uh, of course, you can put it, this thing in harsh environments uh, when there's a lot of rain, if there's uh, lightning storms, or if there's sandstorms, uh, your fiber optic sensing is going to be able to withstand that. And so I just want to kind of talk about some various 
applications of uh, fiber optic sensing for safety and security. Uh, something like this, uh, if we talk about security in the military, fiber optic sensing is uh, very useful for border control. Uh, you could possibly deploy a fiber optic sensor along the border. Uh, and something like this is advantageous because you're able to uh, detect um, intrusions that create vibrations, for example, like walking or driving or something like this along the border uh, over many miles. Uh, and uh, this is advantageous where you have areas along national borders where you might not have access to electrical infrastructure or you, where you might not be able to deploy more canonical things like cameras. So a fiber optic sensor, when it's deployed, can really aid in uh, in um, securing your border. Uh, you could put this in uh, a building for security. Uh, similar situation, uh, you may not be able to put cameras or other sensors all over the building, or when you do, you, it may be a complicated deployment. We, uh, but for fiber optic, you, even using existing fiber optics in the building, you might be able to uh, detect uh, people coming in and out of the building or uh, secure your building in that way. Uh, similarly, for intrusion detection, in intrusion detection, uh, you can put this fiber optic on a fence or a wall, uh, or you can bury it around a perimeter of a prison or uh, or an airport, and uh, it enables you to be able to detect intrusions uh, where you may not have cameras or you may complement um, the ability to uh, see things with cameras. Uh, this may be especially important in something like a prison or an airport because uh, over those large perimeters, you may have many cameras and your controllers may not be able to view all the cameras at once, but utilizing a fiber optic on the fence or around that perimeter, it may be able to trigger and to integrate with those cameras. So you only look at camera views when you have an event and it may uh, give you more coverage and it may uh, also get, uh, uh, lessen the stress on the operators. Uh, in terms of public infrastructure, um, like I said in the beginning, these uh, f you can use put fiber optics along roads, highways, or, or even things like dams, uh, especially for railroads or highways. Uh, fiber optics uh, will are able to sense the vibration from things like trains or vehicles, uh, as I showed you in the previous slide. Uh, you may be able to detect things like traffic. Uh, you may be able to detect the uh, position of vehicles or uh, or the um, trains on the railroad. Uh, and that may uh, facilitate things like switching or management of the uh, scheduling of the of the rail of the trains on the railroad, or on a highway, it may allow you to monitor traffic over a, um, a metropolitan area. Uh, so you can uh, uh, you allocate um, highway resources accordingly. Uh, in the energy industry, uh, of course, you could use fiber optics to sense uh, things like power lines. Uh, one important thing from, an, I think, a network provider perspective is that they want to understand when their network is down, and that typically uh, is associated with the breaking of a cable or something like this. So uh, many electrical power lines already have fiber optics installed along them. So you could uh, effectively use that fiber optic to sense whether a uh, power line is overheating or you could use it to detect if there is sagging or maybe there's ice that's uh, dragging down the cable. Effectively, it may reduce the required maintenance of the telecom provider uh, to, to be able to do these things, or it, may, or, it, or it may immediately allow them to address problems in the network, like a sagging or broken power line when it happens to decrease downtime. Uh, and of course, uh, the, there are many applications of fiber optic sensing in the oil and gas industry. Uh, one big application is pipeline leakage. Uh, by putting a fiber optic along a pipeline, you're not only able to uh, determine if the pipeline is leaking, uh, but also you could determine if there is third-party intrusion. Uh, this happens a lot in remote areas where people try and tap into pipelines uh, to get the oil and gas uh, inside there, or even uh, kind of unscheduled construction that may um, uh, tamper with the pipeline unnecessarily. Uh, and again, with transportation, uh, fiber optic sensing, by plugging, you know, plugging into an existing telecommunication network, you'd be able to sense a number of different things like uh, traffic on a road, like I said before, or trains, but also you could put fiber optics within the actual uh, vehicles themselves to be able to det uh, detect the structural integrity of them. 
Uh, and of course, uh, and it's something important, especially important for a place like Japan, uh, disaster monitoring is possible with fiber optic sensing. Uh, it's, you know, in, in mountainous areas where highways have to go through the mountains there, where there may be a lot of tunnels using the temperature sensing, you may be able to detect fires in those tunnels. Uh, so you can kind of, uh, alert emergency response teams to mitigate it, uh, accordingly. Or you may be able to detect things like landslides or, or predict or look at the erosion of the earth to uh, understand when landslides are going to happen. And so I'll kind of leave it at that. Uh, and uh, I'll, uh, so I'll open it up to questions. Uh, and I uh, thank you very much for your time and interest. Uh, thank you very much for a very in informative presentation. Uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, you can type it uh, on the box uh, to the right. Uh, but let me kick it off uh, a little bit uh, with a, a question. You know, you've done a great job of talking about uh, how fiber optic technologies uh, integrate with other technologies. Um, can you kind of elaborate on some of the technical issues that you as a company have addressed and maybe how, perhaps how you've kind of overcome some of those integrations? Yes, I think uh, the, the sometimes the biggest technical issue is more of a person issue. I mean, uh, with this new technology, you have to try to convince the um, existing operators of, uh, in, in, in some sense for security, the security operators to accept your technology. So those technical issues are more convincing them that to not be afraid of the technology. So we have uh, software that's very easily viewable and accessible by the operator that kind of takes the stress off them not understanding what the sensor is and just enables them to get actionable data. So I think those are, that's a pr um, an important technical thing that we've run into a number of times is being able to provide the fiber sensing data very consumably to the operator. And that uh, we've been able to overcome that by uh, basically uh, in the background, machine learning based AI takes a more complicated fiber optic sensing signal and converts into something that's simply consumable by an operator who may not know what a fiber optic is. Sure. Could you comment a little bit on how accurate your artificial intelligence is? Uh, yes. So the accuracy of the artificial intelligence is, uh, I mean, I'll say quite high, but uh, I should say that uh, in NEC, we um, have, a, have a lot of machine learning based AI techniques. Uh, a lot of those techniques go into uh, things, for example, like facial recognition. And just to give you context, the, the facial recognition that we have is uh, kind of consistently rated number one by NIST uh, because of the advances in those machine learning based AI techniques. And so we have the same accuracy in our fiber optic sensing products. So we, it's, it's very high because of the sophistication and uh, the ability to test improve our machine learning based AI, not only in fiber optic sensing, but in other applications like stock market and cancer detection and face recognition. Uh, thank you. Could you kind of talk about some of the applications you have, some of the installations you have? Perhaps you can mention some, some broader categories. Uh, yes, we have a number of different uh, deployments and applications around the world. Uh, we work with um, a lot of telecom providers. We work with uh, a number of different governments. Uh, we work with a number of different uh, commercial customers. Uh, the Some of our more interesting applications are uh, working with telecom providers because we kind of can convert what was not understood as something that can be used for sensing into something that's sensing. Uh, so uh, as a global company, we have a footprint in a number of different countries, and uh, so we have applications kind of uh, everywhere. And of course, uh, if uh, anyone wants any more details, we're more than uh, happy to discuss offline. Sure. And could you talk a little bit about uh, temperature sensitivity? I know you mentioned that uh, in, in many kind of cases, you don't, there's not a temperature effect. Sometimes that's something that it gets, can be integrated. Is that something that uh, you guys can accommodate? Yes, I think if, of course, if you're doing temperature sensing with fiber optics, then uh, you want to sense temperature changes, even if undo temperature changes. Uh, so we have we have quite good temperature sensitivity with our sensors. Of course, if you're doing something like vibration sensing and there's large temperature changes, that could affect the vibration changes. However, we're able to track those changes 
with things like the AI, but also with just our fiber optic expertise to understand the difference between, for example, a real vibration event or a uh, some kind of big temperature swing. So if there is a big change in the season, for example, if the ground freezes, uh, then we're able to understand how sensing would change if it changes and we're able to um, adjust for it. Now, you didn't touch on, or you could probably elaborate on, obviously conduit is the preferred means for uh, uh, fiber optic deployment for many applications. Uh, I assume you guys can accommodate all of those. Do you have any particular approach that uh, you take in when you decide whether or not to do conduit or not to do conduit? Uh, that that's a good question. I, I think that it depends on the customer. Uh, you know, if if there's if the customer has existing infrastructure where the fiber is already in conduit, uh, then that kind of is what it is. Uh, but again, we're able to uh, adjust for that. Of course, your what you can sense when it's in conduit changes, of course, because you have to transduce through the conduit and then into the cable. So we can uh, adjust for that with a lot with our uh, fiber optic. Uh, digital signal processing and with the machine learning based AI. So I, I, I wouldn't say we necessarily have a preference. I think that we um, can work around whatever the customer has. Uh, and so some customers may want to newly deploy fiber and conduit to be able to protect the fiber. And we can also account for that. Now, you described a number of the sort of um, uh, perimeter intrusion applications. And I guess one of the comparisons is with the uh, using um, uh, television or using cameras to uh, track activity. Um, can you kind of comment on sort of the financial trade-offs between over long distances uh, doing cameras as opposed to fiber optic? Uh, yes, I think that the uh, financially, I think that you know, it, it depends on your deployment. But of course, uh, with fiber optics, when you have less to deploy, uh, then it's, it is always better. Uh, but all, not only that, but when you deploy fiber, it's, it, when you deploy fiber optic, if we, if we compare to something like cameras, then you don't need electrical power uh, along the length of the deployment, which could be tens of miles. Uh, equivalently to deploy something like cameras over tens of miles, you need to supply them with electrical power. You need to communicate with them. So that infrastructure also has an associated cost. Uh, and so therefore, in that comparison, the fiber optics uh, are advantageous. Of, of course, uh, I don't think fiber optics is necessarily a replacement or a competitor to camera. I think it's quite complementary. Uh, in places where there are cameras, your fiber optic can lessen the strain on the resources of cameras, whether it be data throughput from camera to the operator, or be uh, maybe you, it will uh, allow you to provide less cameras and therefore less infrastructure and less uh, things to, to to deal with. And, and of course, there's going to be areas where it's just not possible to deploy cameras. And then something like a fiber optic may be your, your only resource, which is good. And I guess I would add, too, that one of the things that fiber optic uh, uses as a, as a solution is redundancy in the event that uh, cameras are out or obviously that, as you mentioned, uh, uh, sort of atmospheric conditions, night uh, or rain, uh, interfere with uh, how far the, the cameras can detect. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, the range that uh, fi you can use fiber over? Uh, obviously, distance is one of the uh, advantages. That, that, that's a great question. Uh, I think typically, you know, fiber optic sensing is limited by how much light is in the fiber uh, for everyone around the world who, who deals with fiber optic sensors. It's kind of a fundamental physical limit. Uh, so at NEC, I, I, I think those uh, for for everyone around the world, those distances are typically something like 40 kilometers, 50 kilometers, 55 kilometers, something like this. Those are the ba like fundamental limits of what you can detect based on how much light is left in your fiber after those distances. Uh, at NEC, we kind of are, are privileged to uh, to have the expertise in long distance fiber optic communication. Uh, again, one of our uh, main products is uh, transoceanic submarine cable networks where our distances are typically thousands of kilometers. So we have kind of been able to uh, study that for a long time and we understand how to deal with very low light levels over very long distances. Uh, so our distances will typically exceed 40, 50, 55 kilometers because of that. Uh, let me come back to a question about your artificial intelligence and um, the ability to detect uh, sort of abnormal or uh, 
uh, unexpected events like uh, obviously along a perimeter, it could involve uh, various types of intrusion. Some aren't particularly nefarious and some are. Um, are you, can you comment on how your ability, the, the technology's ability to be able to uh, uh, get smarter about making those kinds of uh, judgments about what's, what's going on in the field? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, I think that, you know, with machine learning, uh, it all is kind of about the data. You know, I, I've kind of advertised as having these wonderful models and, uh, you know, we're the greatest people in the world for machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. A, a lot of people make great machine learning and uh, a lot of machine learning is open source nowadays. So sometimes it's about understanding the data the best and adding to your data source. So uh, with um, with our machine learning, basically, we're able to kind of uh, learn as we go. So we, as you add more data and you understand the environment more as time goes on, you can improve what you're learning. And so things that are unexpected, uh, you can kind of account for. Uh, and of course, if, if there are really good machine learning models that we have, and so we have the ability to detect anomalies, uh, even without having, uh, you know, that knowing much about what the environment is. We can kind of just create something that we understand is normal and then we can understand an anomaly really well with the different models that we have. I think we've come on. Can you talk a little bit about some of the future applications you see? Are there things down the road that uh, markets that have not developed yet that uh, you think are opportunities for fiber optic sensing in the sort of in the security realm? That's a great question. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, I, I think it's. Uh, I'm probably not able to answer that myself. I think because, I uh, maybe no one's really able to answer that because a lot of applications are things that happen when the unexpected happens. You know, as um, as a company, we like to look at things uh, in as in this kind of co-value creation with customers. So what we try and present is very good technology. We like to understand our technology as much as possible, and then we like to work with the customers to find those new applications. Applications. Uh, so I think that, you know, um, for me, uh, I've been working a lot in perimeter intrusion amongst other applications of fiber optic sensing. It would be exciting for me to kind of see uh, this fiber optic sensing for perimeter intrusion to become more adopted. Uh, and as it's beco it becomes more adopted, I'm sure that the uh, security operators will start to learn that they can do more with the sensor, uh, whatever, whatever that is. So, so maybe my, my answer is uh, I'm kind of excited to see what we discover with customers as we go down the line. Well, that's a that's a that's a great starting point. Um, I think we've run out of uh, questions so far. Um, so well, thank you. I, I will answer one question that frequently comes up, uh, and that is that this webinar in, in its entirety will get posted to uh, the Fiber Optic Sensing uh, YouTube uh, page, and so people will be able to download it then. Uh, and I would remind folks that we've got uh, a schedule of uh, webinars coming up for the next uh, uh, next several months in October. Uh, we will have one from AP Sensing. Uh, in November, our FOSA Technology Committee will have a uh, presentation on fire, fire detection, uh, so using fiber optic sensing in, in that realm, which is uh, one of the security areas uh, uh, that we haven't talked about, but certainly one that is an important one. And then in December, uh, Slumberjay uh, will be doing it, another presentation. Uh, so we've got three coming up, uh, all coming up on, uh, I think they're all on the Thursday of the month, roughly in uh, a general cadence. So again, gentlemen, thank you very much for what was a very informative presentation. Thank you. And that concludes our uh, webinar.